is good at, for example, video conferencing, right, multimedia and collaboration, uh, training uh, tools, right, real-time content delivery in terms of university campus, right, social media and video surveillance, right? So this application can be applied to any of the verticals we mentioned before and uh, can be used broadly in different type of uh, multiple situation, right? So uh, here next I'm going to give you several uh, uh, examples in, in, in terms of uh, uh, what we have seen in the marketplace, people have started thinking about it or started doing some pilot in terms of using WMS in their specific uh, market situation. Okay, here, here's one case, right, the uh, mobile office, right, and uh, so right now, right, device is getting smaller. In addition to laptop, uh, the laptop, we have a, a netbook and MIDs, right, they're, they're portable, you can carry with you, and they're more capable than the cell phone, for example. Right, with WebMax and uh, with a more capable interface and the processing power, you can carry that with you for a lot of the business applications right, when you're on the road. So it become a mobile office tool uh, to be used. Uh, so um, basically you can, you can be uh, active and uh, collaboratively in a, uh, through a multimedia collaboration with your colleagues anywhere when you travel uh, with those type of devices, right, with a full office capability in terms of uh, Word and uh, document editing, for example, right? So, so this is one case. And uh, what's more interesting is, uh, is, is uh, the, uh, I put a S, uh, SMB there, small, biz, small media uh, business there, right? Uh, because that in particular has a certain appeal to the provider, right? You can provide uh, services directly, use WebMax to cover the small office situation, right, uh, for their business uh, usage, right? The uh, second one is uh, uh, mobile medicine and healthcare, and uh, we have already seen activities uh, happening in this uh, specific vertical in some country and, and uh, actually enable uh, healthcare uh, uh, with WebMax when, let me just bring up this slide, next one. And this case actually from Taiwan, and uh, they have uh, using WebMax uh, to, uh, to do a unified uh, uh, healthcare, right, uh, architecture here essentially and you can see here no matter where you are at home or in the ambulance right the health care will be provided through the wireless um, access with WebMax and uh, access the medical records and the treatment uh, through a remote doctor for example to to uh, to help the patient right so so this is one case Another one uh, we also seen happening is the city transportation area. And uh, video surveillance is a very big deal in terms of uh, making our cities safer, right? Uh, uh, making the uh, traffic right, more controlled and managed and optimized, right? So that right now, uh, there, there's uh, several right, uh, places in the world uh, that's already happening and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, people have been working on to, for example, making highways, uh, make cars communicating with each other, make uh, make cars visible from a remote center right through WebMax, you know, some some pilot like that already happening. So so these are all new usages for WebMax, so for WebMax right, in certain uh, market vertical. Okay. Uh, railway, that's another big one, right? You can see railway market is very big, especially Europe, Asia. Um, so this particular case also from Asia, Right, you can see here people are uh, starting to uh, deploy WebMax along railroads, right, and uh, make uh, the uh, track more visible remotely uh, in terms of monitoring the safety situation and train uh, 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 communication and also uh, be communication between the ground and the train. And, and, and in this case, the, the inside the train will be Wi-Fi, or outside between the train, between the trains and between the train and the ground will be WiMAX, right? And uh, also uh, through this mechanism, you can also deliver video content directly to the passenger inside the train. That, that's also a huge uh, potential in terms of how things will come out uh, in the next few years. Okay, we'll, we have even a, a customer that uh, uh, using WebMax to control the train, right, between the train, to synchronize between the train and so at the station so that uh, they, can, they can manage the uh, dispatch of the trains and stuff, all right. So uh, public safety, that's also a big deal uh, coming up, uh, you know, in, in some of the projects we're doing. You can see here, and uh, there, there are devices that are WebMax enabled, quite portable. You can carry that with you and travel with you and then capture video and pictures no matter where you are and, and transmit uh, the, uh, the information back to the center control, right? So a lot of uh, 
situation uh, in the uh, in this particular public safety in the uh, I think this is more like city government uh, vertical, right? You can you can see how do you manage the city situation in terms of safety and crime control, right? All of that uh, can 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 also. Uh, Quite interesting uh, situation. And wireless campus, this is the big one because uh, the, we see most uh, cases in this uh, particular application of WiMAX. Uh, it's quite uh, suitable because uh, WiMAX already, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's quite a flat architecture, right? Um, working with Wi Fi pretty well. And you combine WiMAX and Wi Fi together to cover whole campus, right? Indoor, outdoor, and deliver content no matter where you are on campus. You can listen to the lecture anywhere, right, on campus, even in the school bus, right, so you can, you can access the library. So it's a quite interesting situation. There are a lot of attraction, and uh, several major universities right now are considering this use case and try to do uh, deployment in this particular case. So um, I agree with the uh, early uh, speakers that, uh, you know, the LTE, the WebMax, right, I think these two are quite similar. Right. Uh, so uh, I just want to make one point here. Usage is very important, right? Because if, at the end of the day, if ecosystem, the end customer, right? That's become the the, the end uh, story. How things will come out. Okay. That that's it. Yeah. Questions. Any? Okay. Just in particular to your presentation, did you substitute LTE in that presentation? Would that still work? Uh, well, there's an issue. There's one issue. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I'm more into WMS than LTE because that's Intel, right? So, uh, so uh, I have to say that uh, probably more more convenient for WMS because the architecture, because uh, uh, the connection, the similarity between Wi-Fi and WMS. That'll be my comment. Um, I'll, I'll chime in and say yes, you can substitute LTE. Yes, you can substitute uh, HSPA. And, and DO for the same. Right. Carl, do you have any questions? Carl? Is, is, is the day uh, Tuesday? Of course I got questions. <laughs> so, so, so the first question I got is, we, we talked a lot about verticals here this time around, and I want to hear some thoughts about M to M issues and what people think is the interconnection between the verticals and the machine. I, I, I asked um, Hearns earlier, if we're going to see uh, the, the next dual mode uh, device out of the iPhone being Zigbee. So I'm, I'm curious as to what people are thinking is, is the pathway to the verticals integrating the machine to machine type communication. Any thoughts about that? You want to start? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, okay. I mean, that's a multifaceted question, but um, <laughs> as far as uh, enabling verticals, and as far as the pipes being effective, I, I think one of the challenges, you're looking end-to-end, -end, the, the need for an end-to-end -end solution. So uh, increasing penetration adoption of M2M -M is not simply a matter of having the pipe that will allow you to do that. I think we're already there as far as data capabilities today with a 5 megahertz HSPA channel or HSPA plus, if you will. I think we're already there as well as far as DO, if Verizon were willing to deploy uh, enough carriers to support all the applications you wanted. Um, so there, there are some other significant challenges and hurdles. Um, and we talked a little bit about scale and cost. So a lot of the m applications require reasonably low cost uh, modems on the device side. They require a variety of devices that are available based on the frequency bands that those operators Support. Uh, they require uh, low operating costs for the applications because we're not talking about blasting, in, in most cases, not all, a video signal over a particular uh, channel 24-7. We're talking about sending small amounts of data, low data rates at various points in time, which could be separated by six months, for example, someone said earlier. So uh, how do you price that? How do you charge someone for that? Are you going to charge them $60 a month? Or are you going to charge them based on how much data they're consuming? Or are you going to charge them based on the impact they have on, their, on your network? So I, I think there's a lot of big questions that the operators being the ones who enable the enterprises to do this, uh, that the operators have to figure out. They have to figure out their business models. They, they haven't even figured out their business models for value-added services 
on their own networks with phones, which is something we understand now. We've had phones for how long? 25, 30 years in wireless networks. M to M is an even more amorphous, complex, difficult problem for the operators to wrap their minds around. And I, and I know they're motivated to do that now. They're working towards that. But it's going to take some time until we have the business models to make it possible, like an Amazon King, Kindle. It'll take some time until we have the someone who's able to aggregate so many different verticals, so many different needs, so many different applications and devices on common platforms with common uh, development environments, whether it's OS or SDKs, et cetera, so that you can see scale across this, this vast space. So 50 billion devices is a lot for M to M, but uh, 50,000 variations on segments is a lot for anyone to try to develop towards. So I, I think we have a ways to go. So, question I think for, for, for you guys, I mean, if anybody's got a, a view on this, um, so I think we saw that, that LTE and WiMAX are indeed technical substitutes. Uh, just one is more complex than the other, uh, LTE with the MME stuff and all that. But um, you know, when I see all the, all the applications and all the, all the um, uh, business designs, I could certainly sit down and, and write business plans for most of them. I could be totally wrong here, but I don't see any reason, except for the video uh, applications, I don't see any reason why the existing wireless technologies can't fill the fill those needs as it is. You know, I mean, I, yeah. Any uh, thoughts actually, on this? Or? There's a very special case we have a, a dive, in, uh, dive into very deeply. Uh, in particular, the uh, railway application, right? Uh, we analyzed uh, uh, 3G compared with OM, the WiMAX and decided uh, 3G is just absolutely not uh, capable and uh, based on the customer requirement, in particular, the upstream uh, data speed is not good enough for video transmission. And uh, so basically, the you know, that was a problem. It's basically, uh, we had a debate, uh, you know, between the customer side and the several telcos and also uh, several companies together and decided, uh, you know, we... Oh, I understand that. Do, I understand so. that. But yeah. other than video, yeah. the rest of the applications seem to me like they, they would work on... Well, well, well even yeah. video, let me jump in here. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> even a video is not necessarily a problem because you're not getting any more spectral efficiency out of YMX than you are out of HSPA. By the way, Deutsche Bahn runs on their IC high-speed trains. What? HSPA. So in any event, uh, what I was going to say about that is if you need more spectrum to support an application, you need more spectrum. It's not a function well, not of the, the technology. It's a function of how much spectrum or the, how big is the channel that's being deployed for that particular application. Uh, video, sorry, I hate talking so much, but video is a, is a very interesting case, okay? A broadcast application where you want to deliver a large amount of content, high def content, for example, to 50,000 people, you're not going to do that over a unicast network, LTE, WiMAX, you name it. You're wasting spectrum. It's the same content. You're feeding different streams to a lot of different people. Even multicast packets over LTE or WiMAX or DO is not the most efficient way to do it. There are networks that are designed for that. Let them serve that purpose. Video unicast does, there are cases where people want that and their business models for that. The price point needs to be higher to reflect that. But that's that's a whole other animal. I'm yeah. not sure, but I think Graham's going to tag on here. So. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to bring back to the title of, you know, ask you guys to commit. Intel did. They didn't mention LT once in their presentation. But I, I would challenge you 100%. I mean, yeah, we can get some pissy video on, on, on HTTPA, but it's really useless. Uh, and two years ago, none of us paid 30 bucks a month for data services because it didn't work. It didn't work well enough. HSPA is getting there. But clearly, when you get to WiMAX LTE Wi Fi and that comparison, you've reached a level of capacity that applications can run reasonably well, if not very well. Yeah. Wi Fi is free, it's unlicensed, we all know what that is. But now we've got an issue WiMAX or LTE. What are they going to charge for it? Who's going to do it? Is it going to work? 
That's the question here, and, and, and I don't think we've got a straight answer. That. Yeah, it, you know, I, I you know I worked with the customer closely in China before. And uh, in particular, some of the large customer, right? Uh, they are very large vertical. They have their own spectrum, right? They don't want a provider coming in to run their business because they have a spectrum. They want to run it. In that case, uh, to consider, okay, uh, everything together. After a lot of thinking, debate, they decide where well, the way to go. And uh, they have a lot of new usages uh, that uh, the switch users cannot meet uh, the requirement, right? So uh, that was conclusion out of a lot of debate. And a lot of the new usages are. Emerging uh, video is a huge deal from the user up, right, uh, from user to the center, not the other way around. The, the other way around are, are uh, proven, right? Everything works, okay? When you transmit video from the ground, for example, to the control center uh, with a high quality, right, uh, that's what required, and that's a big deal for them. So that was really one, two things, right? This one and also spectrum issue. You're expecting a commitment out of... Uh uh, RIM or uh, Qualcomm? Oh, we'll, th we'll throw one your way. Not, not to worry. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'm we do what the customer in all has. these things, so it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> a, good, a, a good information uh, theoretic uh, solution is going to be good no matter what technology in 10 years. I mean, I look out 10 plus years. So. No, I think. I'm sorry, Carl. I was going to throw something in there. No, I do. I do think there is a commitment. I think the commitment on the part of the operators is what's going to determine what happens 10 years from now. Uh, yes, there are specific cases where verticals will have their own networks. Certain large providers can do that. But if you're looking at scale, the big operators are going to determine what happens in this, on this planet, at least, in the next 10 years. What is China Mobile going to do? What's Vodafone going to do? What is Verizon going to do? That is really, the, these are the pipes you're going to be riding on. And they are committing to LTE. They're committing to you're not going to see HSP or DO disappear anytime soon. And no one other than Verizon has actually said that they plan on replacing their existing network uh, with LTE. So that that is what's going to realistically happen, as far as we can tell in our crystal ball. Of course. Well, here's another here's another one about about uh, technology switching costs for you, about uh, replacing HSPA, et cetera. Uh, HSPA and 3G has 240 million subscribers globally. Now, 50 million of them are in Japan, okay? This, I think it'll either happen next month or November of this year. We will have 4 billion GSM subscribers. You're not going to get rid of that stuff easily. You know, not, not, not soon. I don't think, I don't think uh, even in the next, uh, next uh, 15 years. <laughs> what do you do with all these people? So this is another interesting uh, fact here. Yeah, well, I can, okay, how many PCs do we have in this world, too? You know? Far fewer. Far fewer than you have mobile phones, or absolutely, by an order of magnitude. And, and you also have the backhaul equation. I mean, okay, if we're complaining about the data capabilities of HSPA for video, uh, if you've read the signals research report that Mike Thielander wrote on testing the HSPA Plus network that Telstra had, comparing that to the Clearwire slash Sprint network that we have with WiMAX here in the U.S. with three times as much spectrum, you have higher data rates on the Telstra network. So backhaul can choke or can enable whatever application you're trying to serve, uplink or downlink. It's, it's really, I mean, I think this debate is philosophical, and I love it. I love technology ar uh, arms races, but I honestly believe there's going to be zero difference as these technologies are optimized between WiMAX performance, LTE performance, HSP Plus performance, DO Advanced performance, you're not going to see it. It's just, it doesn't exist with the same conditions. So if you want to use 2x2 two two MIMO, if you want to use the same size channel, if you want to use the same amount of backhaul, if you want to put the same site, the same place, same frequency band, you will not see a difference. That's not where it's going to lie. Now, now here, and the interesting thing is I have literally tens of thousands of, of observations, experimental observations in the field that support that. 100 percent, absolutely. I mean, we've done experiments with LTE, physical air, um, where we actually demonstrate handover. Here, here's here's one for you. 15 meters from the antenna. That's about 50 feet, because we're here in the U.S. Um, 48 megabits per second on the downlink to a van. Okay. And the, now, there's no cabin penetration issues because the two antennas are like these big five eighths over five eighths jobs right on the top of the van. So it's going pretty fast. 
And we go 500 meters away, and that drops down at about four, uh, four and a half megabits per second. And we go one kilometer away, and guess what? It's down to 900 to 1100 kilobits per second. Does that sound? That, that sounds like like HSPA, doesn't it? For the same reason, basically, there's only so much stuff you can jam through a, uh, a, a pipe with a certain amount of signal to noise ratio for, for a given amount of bit error probability. So, it's, 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 I mean, what you're saying is absolutely correct. I, I hear you guys, but well, wait a second, Carl. So, yeah. so the question really isn't WiMAX versus LTE. What is the question with those technologies? No, I, I think that is a good question in the sense that, okay, if you're going to invest in something. Do you choose to invest in WiMAX or do you choose to invest in LTE? So I, I think there there are people faced with that question today. And when I was saying the ecosystem matters and the economics matter, I think those angles will help you determine which of these technologies makes the most sense for you. I think the majority of cases, the, the answer is LTE. But there are frequency bands on this planet where there is not planned initially to be any LTE support. So, and which is what's happened to a lot of operators on the planet who are holding 3.3 or 3.5 gigahertz spectrum, what do you deploy? If WiMAX is your only choice and it works reasonably well or well enough, even if you don't have the ecosystem scale or diversity, you deploy it because that's your only choice. You have spectrum. So spectrum really governs, in a lot of cases, your, the option you have. If you have 1,900 megahertz, that is not even a question you can answer. Why? Because you can't deploy WiMAX at 1,900. Your frequency license won't allow for it. There's no equipment for it. So you don't have a choice. There aren't a lot of cases where that question truly matters. 2.5, actually, is the only frequency band where you could deploy one or the other in the future. Actually, 2.5, 2, 2,500 to 2,690 yes. is, is the band that is the most globally harmonized throughout, throughout the world, except for the U.S. But, I mean, that could change. That could change at any point. But... That, would, that really builds you economies of, of scope, because that's how GSM was successful. We started with 900, we flipped on 1800 for more traffic channels and worked the kinks out there. But basically, you can take that radio anywhere, almost anywhere in the world, and use it. And that, of course, caused the the learning curve to kick in, right? So it's like you have the learning curve; it's inverse exponential relationship between the cost and how much stuff you make. And so, the more you make, the cheaper it gets. The cheaper it gets, the higher the demand. The higher the demand, the more you make, and, and it's just and then you end up with cheap everything. <laughs> so I got a question that goes back to Kai's slides because I use the term super Wi-Fi, and in the U.S. there's this company called Google. I know they don't happen in China, so in, in, in the U.S. Google's got, uh, been committing to white space as super Wi-Fi. So my question is, where do we see white space kind of fitting into this? And see an opportunity there. So, Kai, I was hoping you'd give me some thoughts on that. Um, you, you're right. So, in China, we don't have Google there. So, uh, we have something similar. Yeah. How anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so, okay. Uh, I see, um, uh, you know, people mentioned about the comparison between WMAX and LTE, right? So, one thing about WMAX is, is uh, you know, the timing thing, right? I see that uh, WMAX is ahead of LTE, right, by... Uh, I don't know how long, and uh, the devices are available. I think uh, the, te the technology itself certainly uh, quite available right now. You can you can actually use Google can use that you know by working with uh, you know uh, some companies that, like Clearwire, for example, right? And uh, there are cases that we saw, uh, for example, uh, some universities in the U.S. actually have a very similar situation. They got a spectrum and then start to deploy WMAX. Uh, the coverage is not going to be uh, just campus, but also go beyond their campus. It's very similar to Google's situation, right? It's possible. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to mention, Carl, that uh, as you may know, Microsoft research and quite a few companies have been doing something on um, WMAX uh, and they just released a paper a few days ago. They presented it. So, um, and I actually talked to the researcher from Harvard, and he said that they're actually they could be looking at WiMAX and MySpace as well. But for now, they figured Wi-Fi because it's more available and the more devices and it's more popular. Yeah, I, I personally like the idea of WiMAX and unlicensed spectrum. I yeah, actually, I think it's coming up, right? Because uh, you know the the 5.8, that's the unlicensed spectrum for WMAX. I think it's upcoming. 
and some uh, vendors already providing a uh, base station in that space, as far as I know. Other questions? Yes. I just want to welcome Joe Mazio to Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bob King. Are we good? Okay. Please. Economics. Now, technology is pretty much the same. I mean, it's a wash on the whole. Yeah. Um, but economics, I guess, it depends on demand from how many mobile carriers are going to go with that and how many enterprises and so forth are going to go with 500 million people on China Mobile, yes. That's, <laughs> that is pretty much the largest carrier on the planet. <laughs> I'm on GSM right now. <laughs> Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, none of these technologies is really static. So when we talk about uh, WiMAX, they were talking about 802.16e based WiMAX. There is 16m, and actually I won't talk about it too much because that's Kai's province. Um, on the LTE side, you're going to have multiple releases. The initial release, uh, release 8, there will be a release 9, there will be a release 10. Um, as we look towards the more advanced implementations or iterations of LTE, and actually known as LTE advanced, <laughs> um, the areas that we're trying to address are less getting more performance out of the airlink, but more in trying to optimize the network behind it. So you've heard of uh, some of the SON or uh, the deployment related improvements to make it easier to deploy nodes in the network that are self-optimizing. Uh, the ability to leverage both small cell and large cell technology in what are called heterogeneous networks. So how do you put in the intelligence in the standard so that you throw, you throw down a, 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 a pico cell or a femto cell how does that work really well with your macro network without impacting your macro network? How do you load balance between them? Those types of improvements are, are what are being envisioned and planned for LTE. Um, I think you're also looking at just better integration between LTE and some of the existing technologies, so the advancements of HSPA or the advancements of DO, so more tight integration between them. Uh, th those are some of the things we're, that are coming. Okay, I'd like to just say thank you to the panel and uh, let's give them a round of applause.